All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. The title of this session is the role of the CMS data scientist. So we're going to learn more about the CMS data scientists and their role. Uh, we have three on with us today. We have Jeffrey Berryman as well as Noah Johnson and Andrew Yaspin. So at this point, I'll hand it over to you. I think Jeffrey, you are first to present today. So I'll hand it over to you to kick things off for us. That's right. Thank you. So we're going to have three presentations, three mini presentations today during our time. Um, the first one uh, by me is on the NQuick Task Order 3 data submission system that we set up last year. And it's kind of a brief technical testimonial or use case. And then uh, missing data is CDR schema by Noah Johnson. Uh, he's going to present on some work that they did in that on that project. And then a more general presentation, but hopefully we'll tie everything together about how we want to build a foundation for data science practice. And uh, we'll pull some of the uh, some of the concepts that we talk about that Noah and I talk about uh, together into into Andrew's talk, and then we'll have a Q and A session afterwards. So for our session learning objectives, we're going to take a quick look at a couple of data infrastructure projects. That's the stuff for me and Noah. Uh, these are these are all going to be examples of what internal data expertise can enable for for our program. So we've got lots and lots of data expertise on the in, on the contractor side, and I, there's been a push over the past couple of years to improve the internal data expertise at CMS. And these are just some case studies of how that can help out. We're going to introduce a couple of lessons learned and how, what, what kind of challenges we faced from the perspective of the, you know, the internal data scientists, what kind of, what kind of stuff comes up when you're in that position and offer some considerations for how we can, you know, improve the uh, knowledge that we, that we bring to the program and, and better use the, uh, the skills that we have to help our programs out. Yeah. So to kick us off, I'm going to be talking about the end quick. Uh, task order three data submission system um, and i'm trying to try not to get too bogged down into the technical details because we've got some sort of high level concepts that we want to take away from this uh, but it but i do want to first give a impression of the situation that we were in when we came on board so we are on the task order three uh, task order three team we have uh, contractors that are collecting information from hospitals and submitting it to us uh, and we had set up this original submission system that essentially comprised as comprised of an excel template that would be filled out by the hquick contractors and submitted using Dart. And the Excel template uh, had some nice formatting in it that made it uh, presented the data pretty well. It was like, you could open the Excel file and, and the data was right there for you. As a non-technical user, you could go through it and, and filter. And uh, on separate tabs of the Excel template, there were uh, there was uh, supporting information, data documentation, which included things like specifications for the measures that we were using and instructions on how to fill out the template and things like that. The Dart submission system, which has been around for a couple of years now, uh, is well integrated with the core workflow. And so uh, you can do tasks like mark submissions as received and uh, and it notifies the cores when when things are. And so it, all, many, many aspects of the of the core workflow were integrated specifically into Dart. Uh, it allows you to search by program, by submitter, by date, and then download individual files that have been submitted to you. Now, this for sure came with some, some benefits, which I talked about already a little bit briefly. Uh, yeah, the, the cores can acknowledge these submissions within Dart, which was a, a critical feature from a contractual perspective and from a from a program management perspective those excel files uh, with the formatting that was included were accessible by non-technical users so the course could open them up and see exactly what the contractors were talking about and um, they had discussions about the data and once again the documentation was bundled with each data file so that you know these data files were as they were being passed around they always had this documentation with them in a separate tab of course it also came with some challenges uh, dart is not really integrated with data analysis systems. Uh, it uh, kind of accepts documents and files, uh, whether they're text documents or PDFs or, or Excel files, accepts them, stores them, makes them available for download, but doesn't really differentiate or allow you to analyze uh, tabular data. Due to the, uh, the formatting that was in place on, the, on those Excel templates, it made it sort of challenging to export that data. Uh, so if you wanted to import it into a uh, data analysis program, if you wanted to use some of these tools that are available in the CDR, for example, uh, some of that formatting made that difficult, whether it was the extra tabs, whether it was the, you know, the header rows, things like that. Uh, there was no validation on this system. And so any validation had to happen sort of post hoc and also with the challenges of importing it into a data analysis system. So uh, validating the data that was being submitted by the HQuicks became uh, a pretty significant challenge really quickly. And we also had sort of a unique challenge uh, because of a couple of sort of obscure technical reasons. Our uh, data submission files grew significantly every month. We were always receiving a full updated copy of the data. And that was perfectly reasonable. 
in most scenarios, but the result was that uh, we had this fear that we would grow larger than the row limit allowable in an Excel file. And so we, we always had this sort of like, oh, maybe six months in the future, we're going to have this sort of landmine waiting for us. And so with all these considerations, with all these benefits and challenges, we decided to pivot and, and check out a couple of new systems. And uh, we consulted with ISG, we uh, had to put together our list of requirements. And what we ended up with was a system using where the primary differentiator is the use of the software called managed file transfer. Its primary purpose is for sending large files between individual users. So uh, if you have a big file that either uh, is too big to fit in a in an email or it would just be inconvenient. You can send that large file using MFT. It's stored on the MFT servers and the recipient gets a download link and can go download that file whenever they need to. It's also used to implement data distribution lists such as I believe the NHSN data is distributed within CMS for nursing homes by an MFT distribution list. And so if you sign up for that, what you get is a download link that lets you go download that file from MFT. Behind the scenes, MFT also has this feature for configuration with automated workflows. And it allows you to design submittable forms and form a number of features like integrations with other systems. And, and that's not generally super visible. Usually we just use it to, to transfer files back and forth. Uh, but that process is that that uh, capability is available behind the scenes. Now, this is commercial off the, self, off the shelf software. It is not in any sense a general purpose tool. This is not a, this is not a Swiss army knife. It's designed for transferring files. It has these workflows. It does a couple of things. It has relatively limited functionality, but it does have a very user-friendly interface. A lot of sort of drag and drop tools, a lot of very easy to use. These are, these are common features in unmodified commercial off-the-shelf off software. They tend, you'll tend to get one that does one thing well and doesn't solve all your problems, but solves one potential problem. Now, another component of our, of our total system was the Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3. And for those who aren't familiar, this is just what it sounds like. It's just a simple storage system. It's a big hard drive in the cloud for you. Data stored in S3 buckets has a very granular permission system that uh, allows you to share with uh, specific users and specific data systems. Uh, it's very fast, it's very cheap. Uh, it's basically one of the, I would say pretty much the industry standard for simple, for if just what you need is a storage system, uh, you're pretty safe going with S3. And we use it extremely widely at CMS, particularly in the CDR. And yeah, so I guess I should have introduced the CDR before I started referencing it a couple of times. That's the centralized data repository. Most people here will be familiar with it, but just in case you're not, it's an integrated suite of analysis tools and data storage systems that's maintained within CCSQ. It includes tools like Sasvia, tools like Zeppelin. It includes a registry of Hive tables. It also stores the data associated with claims, a couple of different public data sets. And there's a bunch of information about that on Confluence if you're not, if you if you want to find more information about it. The system is maintained by ISG. And it's widely accessible, which is a crucial feature to feds and contractors within CCSQ. If you are someone who works in analytics or has an interest in data and how to use it and has a use case for it, you can probably get access to the CDR and you can probably figure out how to use it pretty quickly. That's one of the, it's just very, this sort of wide access model was, was very critical to us because we wanted to be able to interface with other teams and, and have access to the tools that other people use. We didn't want to be using our own boutique system. So the these are the three main components of our of our submission system, managed file transfer, S3, and the CDR. And it required some startup work. I was done by ISG to create a, or by an ISG contractor to create a custom MFT form. I had a simple file upload dial, dialog and some text input that allowed us to put in email addresses. So once that work was done, this could be made visible to the submitters and they would fill out this form anytime they were submitting a data file. The automated workflow would accept an upload of a CSV file. We pivoted away from the Excel template and switched to using a, a much simpler CSV file. The automated workflow will then perform basic format checks, check to make sure that numeric columns are numeric, positive values are positive, et cetera, and then uploads that file to an S3 location. If any of those validation checks fail, the user is notified with some row level error messages. This kind of quick automated loop to notify users with explicit error messages was one of our crucial features that was totally missing from our prior workflow where lots of stuff had to be, this, this kind of process had to be managed by, by an individual, by one of our contractors or one of our personnel. And so having the system automated suddenly made everything so much, so much simpler. The S3 location where it uploaded the files 
is directly accessible from SAS via Zeppelin and other CDR integrated tools. So for example, the pilot that you've heard about recently in the previous presentation, presentations to use Databricks and, uh, and other data analysis tools. Because this S3 location is accessible from the CDR, I was instantly able to use those tools, even though they were only in pilot form, to access our data. And so the test that I was able to do using those using those tools was, was operating on our data. It didn't require us a large amount of additional work to get access to our data using those pilot tools. And then finally, this is more of a general sort of statement that so far has proven true, is that benefits to the CDR, improvements to the CDR benefit our program instantly. We don't have to ask for <laughs> new tools. Whenever new tools are added to the CDR, we're able to use them almost instantaneously. And it might require, you know, hey, can you hook up our S3 bucket to make sure that we have access to this tool? But it's that sort of democratization and uh, we're, we've, we're working in the commons. And so whenever new stuff gets added for everybody, we get the benefit of it. So I've kind of, this has been a very quick overview of the technical aspects of, of what we were doing as we set up this new system. And it's been fairly low on detail <laughs> because I wanted to focus on uh, a couple of big overarching takeaways that I treated as sort of my lessons learned uh, from this process. First of all, unmodified commercial off-the-self software can make your life much easier. If we had gone to create a boutique solution, uh, what I predict would have happened is we would have ended up with something that perfectly met our needs in the short term and long-term would have required a significant amount of additional maintenance, would have been less flexible for changes to uh, the program. In order to accomplish this and to use this unmodified commercial off-the-self software, we had to accept some limitations. There are validation functions we would have loved to apply here that we were not able to implement inside of MFT. And so we accepted those limitations because, as it says here, perfection is costly, especially long-term. If we wanted to implement everything that we got, if we wanted to do the, you know, that last 20%, uh, get everything we wanted out of this submission system, uh, we would have paid for it over the long-term. Really good infrastructure, works well, it does its job, it uh, forms the task you need it to do, but really great infrastructure is invisible. And so the, the benefit that I've taken away from uh, the lesson that I've taken away from implementing this MFT program and then using it for, for over a year now, I have not had to perform to like chase down bugs and deal with maintenance. Uh, it's been a largely invisible system. So as a result of accepting those limitations in the beginning and saying, this is going to do one thing and we're going to accept what it can, can do and what it can't do, we were able to basically forget about it. And for over a year now, we've had no problems with the system, uh, which is, you know, never a guarantee, uh, but I think accepting those limitations in the very beginning and figuring out, uh, you know, what the system can and can't do and accepting what it can't do was really important in making that possible for us. That's it. I hand it over to Noah to talk about the missing data in QMARS. Thanks. Let me see if I can control the slides. Can someone give me the ability to move the slides? Let me see. I think my, my settings are configured to not allow that. No, I apologize, but um, Janae will be able to help you out. Okay, so I'll just say next slide. Okay, so what I was doing was, you know, so from a data science perspective, I think that people were really ambitious here about what we could do with the data, but that's available in the CDR, which Jeffrey sort of covered. Um, but what I found, my experience was that some of this data that we have stored in tables is actually really hard to use. Um, it can be unreliable for one reason or the other. There are some formatting issues. There's missing data issues. Uh, there's lack of data dictionary issues. So I decided, I decided to start going through and uh, sort of quantifying some of the data quality issues that we might want to address before we can really start moving forward to being a data-driven organization. So <clears throat> I was working on a project where I noticed that the table that I was using had just null values all over the place. And the, these were included for variables that we, we probably should have had, like race and, and so on and so forth. So I decided to start yeah. with looking at missing data. So if we go to the next slide. So I wanted to go through and quantify the missing data. So I wanted to go through and look at how often data was missing for every column, yes, uh, every column in every table in the QMARS schema, which is a, a schema in our, in our division. Okay. 
So there are different types of missing data. So it's not necessarily if there's something missing that it's, it's bad, right? So you could have something missing because it could be calculated with other variables. And so we decide not to populate it. It could be null deliberately because there's simply a way to calculate it using other columns if you wanted that information or it could legitimately have not been collected or there just wasn't an option. So for example, with gender, if we only gave someone male and female, if someone identifies differently, you know, maybe it's null. So there are legitimate explanations for null. Um, there are also illegitimate ones, like it just wasn't collected for whatever reason or it wasn't imported from a table properly. It's really hard to know beforehand uh, what it is, but regardless of why, I was concerned about just how widespread this problem was. So if we can go to the next slide. So what I did was I used Databricks and I went through every single uh, table in the CDR, uh, at least in the, in the chemo, which is the one relevant to my division. And what I found was by table, you know, a lot of the time, actually there was a good amount of data. So 60 of the tables, which is the vast majority of them had missing data in only zero to 10% of the cells. But what was more concerning was that for 20 and change tables, almost half of the data was missing. And so this makes it really hard to work with and to be able to give unbiased analyses. Uh, next slide. So uh, here you can see the same uh, calculation from the previous slide, except I, I sorted this by the size of the tables. Because I wanted to see, is this problematic? Uh, is the missing data problem sort of disproportionately in some of our bigger tables that we use more often, or is it in some of the smaller tables? And you can see that it's actually pretty evenly distributed. Uh, some small tables have almost all the data there. Some have almost none, almost none of it, okay, or about half of it. I'm going to focus on this dot here at the top right. So that was the biggest table for which there was over 40% of the data missing. And that's the appeal case type detail table. And we use that a lot. So that's actually an incredibly important table for us. It is where we store almost all the data for one of our task orders. And so the fact that over 40% of the data there is missing was, was disconcerting. Uh, next table or next slide, please. So what I ended up doing was I said, look, you know, looking at the whole table, how much data is missing might be skewing the distribution by column, right? You could have every column, if 50% if of the data is missing, you could have it be every column uh, is 50% missing or half the columns could be 100% all the data is there and half it's all missing. So again, I went back to Databricks and I, I ran some code that went through every column in every table in the schema. And and I found that, you know, for the vast majority of, of tables or all columns, all the data is there, right? So, you know, you have 2,965 columns for which almost all the data is there, 0 to 10%. But for almost, you know, 850 columns, almost all the data was missing. And I think that is really worrying. Why, why would we have a variable in there if it basically is, is almost irrelevant because we don't seem to care that it's almost all missing. Uh, next, next slide. So I focused on that bigger table or that, that table I mentioned, the, the appeal case type detail. And, and this was what was disconcerting is that the most common outcome, which was a, a third of the, the, the table uh, columns in that table were almost completely missing, 90 to 100% missing. So this is in very difficult for the data scientist who's trying to derive something from this, okay? So, you know, I found that this was true. If you want to be looking at appeals, so an appeal is, is, is someone questions whether they were appropriately discharged from a hospital based on their Medicare benefits. You know, a lot of the times, you know, 90% of the time, uh, the, the provider for, say, a Medicare Advantage plan is missing. Now, if you're a fee-for-service beneficiary, it should be missing. But even if you remove fee-for-service, almost always the plan name and the plan type were missing. So that's really critical data for us is, you know, knowing like, are there certain Medicare Advantage providers that are, are generating a lot of these appeals? So this is the sort of thing where the missing data was really getting in the way. Next slide. Oh, my bad. So here you can see every single column for which the data was missing 90 to 100% of the time. 
And I, I focus here on these ones where it's 99 to 100% missing. Now, this is almost always missing, right? These ones strike me as really problematic because you, either we should decide we need this and for, you know, fill it out or for the sake of parsimony, remove them. Now, some of the stuff should be easily obtainable, right? Email address or beneficiary email address. We should definitely have that information. So I don't know where the, the source of the problem is. Are we not collecting it? Are we assuming that it's in the beneficiary tables, not in, in uh, excuse me, in the, in the QMARS tables? that we use specifically. So we figure we can just pull it. The beneficiary's insurer's name, like again, if there's a Medicare Advantage program, like don't you think we'd wanna know who the insurer is? So I found a lot of these really uh, disconcerting. Uh, but even if you look at the 90 to 99% missing column, uh, the, the bottom one is Benny race description, okay? We definitely know the race of our beneficiaries, but it's just not being pulled here. So we have a technical problem, right? We could get that information from the beneficiary table elsewhere in the CDR. And I think we're supposed to be doing that, but it's not coming through. So I think all that's to say, I think that a lot of work could be done here to make sure that there is a data quality standard um, that we live up to. Because as an analyst, if you say we wanna care about, if you wanna look into a health equity issue, we can't really look in this division's data set and say, show me this by, by race because 90% of the time it's missing. Now I can go and link it with the beneficiary table. It takes a couple extra steps, but it's hard, especially for a new analyst to say, wait a second, there is a race variable, but why is it, you know, why is it always missing? Especially when there's poor documentation. So anyways, I think the the, the main thrust of my presentation is uh, I think that we're really making progress on getting better about da doing data science here, but to do more advanced data science, we really need to fix some of these foundational problems in terms of uh, having higher data quality. Thank you. Hello, I suppose I'm next. My name is Andrew Aspen, and I'm going to uh, follow that set of really great presentations, although they're a tough act to follow um, with some high level learnings, um, you know, a description of uh, the hats that I and, and I, you know, my colleagues too, as well, uh, wear or some of the hats that we wear uh, in working here as data scientists for CMS. Uh, some lessons I've learned and uh, some ways that I think we can all work together to address uh, some of the issues that Noah and Jeffrey presented uh, as it relates to, you know, sort of using technology most efficiently to meet our goals uh, to be data driven here at CMS as well as understand what gaps we have to fill in the knowledge um, gaps. So, um, you know, quickly about me, obviously a data scientist here, I'm within the Division of Beneficiary Reviews and Care Management. I have responsibilities also at the group and center levels. Uh, so we do have this sort of cross programmatic view uh, and we are uh, considering ways that data can be used across divisions, across programs, in order to be more proactive and effective in making you know near-term decisions. Uh, my background is in computational analysis and public policy, as well as informatics, data science, for the local government. I've been here for almost two years. Next slide, please. So as has been stated, you know, there is a ton of potential benefit from um, using our data. Uh, and you know, something of note that I've generally used as a way to, I think, you know, uh, recruit us here is to bring up that really CMS has one of the most extensive catalogs of healthcare data, especially when it comes to Medicare beneficiaries. Um, and we know that this data covers a, a like pretty wide range of uh, quality improvement efforts, as well as uh, information at the beneficiary level, facility level, uh, you know, we have access to outside data sets that can also uh, further uh, enrich our data. Uh, and we know that because we are CMS, we're a government entity, uh, that the data can influence decisions. And, you know, we can basically have the proximity of those decision makers, the program staff, their proximity to the contractors, all be, you know, used in a feedback loop to best inform decisions in a way that, you know, would be representative of how we'd want 21st century government to work. Uh, next slide, please. So within roles that we play include technical translator, uh, data miner. I think Noah did a really nice job sort of 
glossing over some of the the fine details that he had to learn in order to uh, even present what he did around the QMARS data, uh, reviewing analytical deliverables, uh, making sure that you know we're providing uh, inputs to program staff uh, as it relates to interpreting the data or pointing out where we can get additional fields or points of data um, to further to interpret data for more in, uh, decision making. Uh, we're also involved in uh, charting the future for the programs, involved in the 13th scope or statement of work planning and contract writing. Uh, we also work with collaborators to try and enable their access to uh, data tools within CMS uh, and to uh, troubleshoot someone within the uh, within the agency can help uh, to more to quickly come to a resolution. Uh, we also do ourselves, as you saw, uh, analysis and troubleshooting in terms of the technical aspect of uh, submitting data and trying to reinforce the importance of data quality. Uh, next slide, please. And then within CCSQ, as you heard in an earlier presentation, we are pretty heavily involved in providing feedback on uh, the programmatic platforms that we can use to access the data, uh, as well as consider um, cross uh, way da ways data can be used across the center uh, so that we can understand our po the population we serve better as a baseline, and then use that data as intelligence uh, to be proactive or to find synergies in the way that we're approaching different issues that the beneficiaries have uh, at various levels and interactions with the agency. Uh, and then engaging in end-to-end -end projects that look into priority area, areas of concern. Uh, so tomorrow, I won't unfortunately be able to present live because I'll be presenting uh, similar information to a different group of people. Uh, but a recording of a presentation on identifying potential fraudulent diagnoses of schizophrenia will be uh, shown alongside Douglas Block's great work on vaccine mandates. Next slide, please. Uh, so just some high level lessons, and, and I think these resonate pretty well with what we've already heard and some of the ways that newer platforms and I guess further evolved uh, data sets can uh, further our work here. Uh, data access is complicated for many reasons, some of, uh, some of which will never change. Uh, there are data sets that live in certain places in CMS that just will not be the CDR. And there are times that we're going to have to reconcile that, or there are going to be different versions of similar data uh, in different places because that data uh, was uh, transformed for a particular purpose or uh, conformed to a particular standard uh, that, you know, at a point in time served a specific purpose. And the idea of general interoperability just was not what it is today. Uh, using pilots and giving feedback is invaluable for the organization. So to the degree that I can promote, uh, you know, others being involved in any experimental ways um, of leveraging the data, accessing the data, uh, transforming, just trying out the various things that we need to in order to learn something new about the data or more uh, or expanding access to it uh, is extremely important. Uh, so that that's a, you know, a call to internal and external alike to the degree that people can be involved in pilots uh, or just trying something new. Uh, the priorities of leadership are very deterministic of whether or not issues with our data will be addressed in a given time frame. So, you know, realizing how to communicate important aspects of data quality or gaps in the data or what we need in order to fulfill, you know, high level administrative goals or anywhere in between us and those high level administrators is very reliant on making the, the most of our ability to communicate those issues with them. Um, there is an interest in learning standard and extensible methods for exploring, analyzing, sharing, and communicating our findings on data. But this is a main challenge. And the amount of capacity and investment we have towards this aspect of we can all sort of learn together, we should all be building institutional knowledge uh, and not starting from uh, square one when it comes to trying to uh, be able to analyze uh, something from our data for the purpose of informing decision uh, should be possible. Uh, and, you know, another learning is, and maybe this will change, is it's hard to drive the adoption of new tools without full adoption by the entire center. Uh, so, you know, really trying to 
uh, engender and incentivize uh, not conformity, but people being able to sort of try new things in the name of like modernization for the benefit of our beneficiaries is extremely important. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to highlight certain challenges. And again, this is at a high level and most of the notes sort of indicate that there are ways that we're seeing progress, but uh, you know, there, there are still some gaps um, that are related to the fact that we have sort of a technical group and we have a program group and there hasn't historically been a lot to it getting into the nitty gritty on data together. So I'm not necessarily going to get into uh, the details of everything on this slide, but I will say that the challenges lie with data provenance and lineage. So understanding the history and uh, really the, the journey of the data over time and how things have changed, uh, data ownership and governance, uh, just even understanding sometimes who has the authority to um, make changes to data and, and uh, similarly make changes to the documentation around data. Uh, next documentation, uh, there is a lot that I'll, and I'll get into this one a bit more, uh, you know, wanting in terms of making data uh, documentation ready, available for people to feel comfortable with getting into the data and uh, transforming it, normalizing it uh, to the right level in order to even start analysis. Obviously we're making strides with analytical tools I think sometimes people don't even know what, where the data is. Um, and, you know, I think that's getting better. I think having a data catalog and thinking about the next evolution of that uh, is great. Uh, and I think something that data scientists, uh, internal data scientists, and the ways that we're trying to communicate about data within uh, CCSQ that's improving uh, is going to address the fact that uh, generally uh, program staff are reliant on people to interpret their data, to provide deliverables with aggregate information that people imagined would be useful during the beginning of the contract or, you know, during contract writing. And so um, we need to find ways to inform the analysis that we do uh, in a way that that is more, uh, more relevant to the problems that staff are seeing, uh, you know, in a more reasonable time frame in a more relevant time frame as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just to expound on the challenges of documentation, uh, oftentimes we don't know what a column contains. I mean, sometimes uh, the naming convention allows for someone to know exactly what it is, uh, but people can, would might, might be surprised to see some of the way that claims and how impossible it is to interpret what they have. And then, uh, you know, beyond that, when you start to look at the data, you know, having trouble then interpreting uh, what the value set contains and what you're supposed to derive from that column. Uh, oftentimes there isn't really great uh, documentation on the workflow or not even the workflow, just the sort of way the data is generated. Uh, this is important because then you can understand sort of the object orientation of what is collected in a row uh, and how that might be uh, captured over time, which uh, informs whether or not you're gonna make certain transformations to look at the data on a longitudinal basis, for example, uh, or to you know set up some sort of observational study uh, that, or even machine learning uh, model. Uh, as was highlighted, missing data, uh, how data relates Two workflow and aspects of the work can be improved and it's more just filling in the blanks. And then obviously there is an issue with missing data that Noah went over. Um, and I think, you know, we're just starting to try and figure out how to get everyone uh, interested and perhaps invested in this idea of knowledge sharing. Um, and there are probably ways that we're going to have to consider how to sort of contrive and structure the ways that we work on data together uh, to meet that goal. Next slide, please. And so I thought, you know, we could sort of take some lessons. This is a, you know, a set of ideas that aren't deterministic. I think, you know, will involve getting feedback from many people, considering, you know, aspects of uh, practical implementation 
uh, that we will need to consider. But I think it would be, you know, helpful to start, you know, the conversation with some of these points. Uh, so it would be great if we leaned in on transparency wherever possible uh, with respect to uh, sharing scripts, uh, definitely methods, uh, always noting our assumptions, the goals of an analysis, uh, and limitations uh, that we would prioritize sharing and lessons learned, those challenges, sharing all the above uh, with the knowledge that this will sort of send the entire agency forward. So not thinking of data as something that, you know, anyone has earned and, and should own uh, and is like part of their secret sauce, but to, to realize that it is something like Jeffrey said, that sort of belongs in the commons. Uh, investing in capacity that helps us organize this information in the most useful way. I think, you know, we have a start there with the, the knowledge, uh, the, the collaboration, the knowledge and collaboration wiki. And something like that, but there's a wiki where we're it's you know we're kind of mimicking some of the uh, like the forum uh, formats for uh, providing questions and answers or, or just findings uh, based on questions that we had ourselves on the data, um, and then you know sort of leaning into uh, movements around standardization uh, and uh, and technology that allow us to encapsulate transformations calculations as code that make let leverage resource that leverage things like fire resources uh, which is an interoperability paradigm and then prioritizing making sure that people understand what we're providing over a sense of urgency when it's you know relatively arbitrary next slide please so some ideas for for how we can accomplish this developing a framework and a structure for documenting the shared learnings ensuring ensuring that you know at the very the very baseline that we're taking notes on what we're noticing that we're sharing that with people that we're sort of assuming other people would want to know it on leveraging this learning sharing it being available on slack posting it to the user collaboration wiki Find a way to contribute. Next slide, please. And then, you know, as partners, um, you know, as CMS, as contractors, as people who are, you know, working on the data, looking out to adopt development best practices around sharing uh, scripts and versioning and continuing to break down silos to kind of embody true collaboration uh, because the knowledge that's, you know, the result of this work uh, is just as important at times as the results of the analysis. And so I think we need to consider, uh, you know, this knowledge as an output, as a product. And I think that might wrap it up. So thank you everyone for your time and we should have time for questions. Great, thank you so much. So I'll give it another minute to see if some questions come in. I'm not seeing any now, but again, uh, special thanks to Noah, Andrew, and Jeffrey. These were certainly all very interesting presentations. I'm just going to give it a couple more seconds to see if some questions come to the chat. Uh, Jeffrey, I see you unmuted yourself. Did you have anything to say? Yeah, there's one question from Monica, um, whether Databricks is now available on the CDR. And it is not, I think that may have been, I may have misspoken or spoken not very clearly. What I was referencing was the pilot that recently closed where Databricks was being tested as an alternative notebook solution. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Oh, and I now see a follow-up question. When will it be available? Uh, CMS is currently evaluating the tools and will make a decision shortly. So we don't have an exact date to share with the community yet, but once that is available, we'll, we'll share that with you all. All right, and with that, I think that concludes our presentation for this session today. So let's go ahead and go on a 15 minute break and then we'll return to our last session for day one which is going to be on the CCSQ data and analytics vision and roadmap for the future. Uh, so at this point, let's go ahead and get the timer set for 15 minutes and we'll go on a short break. <laughs>